Everybody was quiet like three minutes ago. Then I let everybody get loud, and I'm gonna make everybody be quiet. Um, so welcome everybody. This is our first uh, our first seminar in the for the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies this year, and a huge pleasure to have Natalia Porat here um, as a as a postdoc, new postdoc in the department. I'm, I'm by the way, I'm Dan Slater. I'm the new director of the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Natalia is our new one of our two new postdocs. So welcome to us both. Um, and uh, we're also going to be doing some of these events as joint, uh, joint sessions with the Comparative Politics Workshop in uh, Political Science, which we're, we're doing today as well. So we should have a good time for Political Science and Wiser Centers and et cetera. And so uh, Natalia was, uh, got her PhD in Sociology at, uh, at Northwestern. She's also been uh, she was a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford. She was also a postdoctoral fellow at, at Notre Dame. And so we're really excited to have her here and trying to expand in a lot of ways the work of the, the of WCED into questions not just of democracy, but also of authoritarianism. And so we'll be hearing about the question of authoritarianism in uh, Russia, which I think not so much an emerging democracy uh, today. So without further ado, Natalia. Thank you, Dan. And thank you all for coming to this first WCED lecture. Great to see so many people here. So what I'm going to do today is two things. Uh, first, I will give you a snapshot of my future books argument with, uh, about the two models of state-society relationships. And I will give you uh, a few empirical illustrations of both models. And then I also want to invite you to think deeper about the implications of these two models for our understanding of uh, democracy and democratization. And I want to actually spend a significant chunk of time on that. So. In my book, I will argue that there are two ideal types of state-society relationships. And we can distinguish them by answering the question, do the people in this society regard the state as the guardian of their group interests? And if the answer is yes, then people tend to <coughs> trust the state and cooperate with it which makes it easier for the ruler to create centralized organizational structures and use them to abuse state power while being in the position of trust. And if the answer is no, then people tend to distrust the state and resist its attempts to intervene in community matters. Instead of cooperating right away, uh, people start bargaining with the state, which drives clientelism and leads to the formation of decentralized organizational structures. This second model is kind of easy to imagine because currently existing social science theories are really good at capturing and explaining the social and political processes in the situation when group authority is disconnected from the state. And the first one is a little more difficult because this is the situation when the state becomes the very fabric of society. And we have much fewer theoretical <coughs> tools to capture these situations uh, when group authority is merged with the state. And authoritarianism is possible in both cases. But these types of authoritarianism would be very different. And I suggest that we need to, dis to distinguish these two types uh, to understand not only authoritarian regimes, but also <coughs> democracy. So how did I come up with the idea of these two models? I was researching authoritarian resilience in Russia. And I did some quantitative analysis with Russian regional level data. Unfortunately, today I don't have any time to go into de details about this analysis. Um, but I wanted to mention that there was a quantitative basis behind my findings. <coughs> and if you're really interested in all the details, you can read my article in Comparative Politics. So, I was researching authoritarian re resilience and I discovered some relationship between authoritarian resilience and the measure of infrastructural state capacity that I had in my study. But what I also saw was a lot of variation around the regression line. Because it turned out that some Russian regions, uh, in some Russian regions, authoritarianism was a lot more resilient than in others. So it was better able to withstand challenges. Uh, and in some other regions, it was less resilient than I would expect based on my model. So I chose two regions uh, where the resilience was high, that are marked in red ovals, and two regions where the resilience was low, that are marked in blue ovals. And I went to the field. 
I was particularly interested in what was going on at the border between the state and society. So I concentrated on organizations, both state and non-state ones, that occupied that border. There is social, community services, education, healthcare, you know, elderly organizations, youth organizations, things like that. And it turned out that the or these organizations tended to be structured very differently in the cases above the regression line and below the regression line. In this red oval regions, the state tended to take the lead in creating and maintaining these organizations. And people appreciated such attention and support from the state. And both sides considered the situation absolutely normal and right. So to illustrate this, let me give you an example of a network of neighborhood councils and community centers that I discovered in Kemerova City. So a neighborhood council in Russia is a small group of people representing the residents uh, of a certain area that comes together to discuss and work on neighborhood issues. And it has some limited legal rights uh, that helps these councils to deal with utility companies, to do some small um, local infrastructure projects, and, and so on. And many Russian cities have at least a few of those councils in the neighborhoods with particularly active citizens. But in some cities, there are a lot more of those councils than in others. And it turns out that Kemerova city is the absolute champion among the Russian cities in terms of the number of neighborhood councils. For half a million population in 2016, it had more than 7,700 of those councils. And those 7,760 councils were comprised of almost 24,000 volunteer activists, which means that every 23rd person in the city was an activist of a neighborhood council. So if we map that density on Ann Arbor, it would mean that we would have 5,300 activists in Ann Arbor. So it's like really a lot of people. Why so many? Were there like so many infrastructural problems in Kemerova City? So it turns out that Kemerova City was, uh, had so many neighborhood councils because the development of this organizational network was spearheaded by the city government and the city mayor who was a long-term political ally of the regional governor. And the city administration began creating neighborhood councils in 1997. And they did it by reaching out to the most active citizens in different neighborhoods and suggesting to put together such a council that would work with the city administration on various local issues. After creating a few hundred of them, uh, the city administration probably realized it was too difficult to keep in touch with all of them. And uh, they started creating community centers and over time increased their number gradually uh, to 47 by the late 2000s. So these community centers were supposed to serve as a link between the neighborhood councils and the city administration. And they were staffed with salaried municipal employees. And after putting in place these first community centers, uh, the city administration intensified the work of creating neighborhood councils by standardizing it. So they came up with a sample charter, they came up with a standardized ID for the activists, they standardized the reporting forms, and they discussed their progress in involving more and more people in this community work in their yearly reports. Uh, so what did these community centers and neighborhood councils do? They certainly did not limit their activities to local infrastructure issues. What they did was pretty much all kinds of community work you can think of. So they would organize cleanup Saturdays to make the neighborhood uh, look nice. They organized <coughs> holiday celebrations and sports competition. They supported hobby clubs, children's activities. Uh, they organized donation drives for poor families. They even worked with substance addicts to make sure that they have uh, the necessary support um, and medical and social resources to deal with their problems. They organized public lectures. So this is just an incomplete list of what they were doing. And in the process of their work, uh, these community centers were always in touch with the city administration. And city officials sometimes participated in the events organized by community centers and frequently used them as the organizational basis 
to get feedback from the population and to communicate their own messages. And this network of community centers and neighborhood councils is not the only example of a centralized network of public organizations in that region. I had uh, I observed a similar, although not quite as dense, network for pensioners organizations, for youth organizations. So it was certainly more of a style of governance in that region. And in my second case study of a high resilience region, uh, the Republic of Tatarstan, although the picture wasn't quite as vivid, but it was certainly built around the same principles. So let's now talk about the low resilience regions. And what I observed there was completely different. First, I could not find any examples of such centralized structures, uh, although I was deliberately looking for them. I looked at youth organizations, elderly organizations, different NGOs, and I could not find anything. But what I observed instead, to my surprise, was that state officials were reluctant to create new organizational structures. Time and again in my conversations with the people who work in municipal and regional governments, my respondents would say, no, 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 no. we're not going to create more organizations. It will only be worse. Let's work with what we already have. For example, I was talking to, uh, with a person who worked with youth organizations in the city government in Rostov region and asked him about the history of the relationships between the city government and those organizations. And he told me that for a long time in the 90s, nobody was really paying any attention to those organizations in the city administration, other than providing financial support for some of them as uh, a part of so Soviet legacy. They kind of existed by themselves. And even when a small unit uh, in the city administration was created to deal with those organizations, everyone agreed that uh, they should not create any umbrella structure. Instead, they came up with some common organizational platform that comfortably accommodated the organizations that already existed. And I found a similar story with NGOs and another similar story with Association of Municipalities in that region. And the message of state authorities to the grassroots public organizations was always that we're not touching you, you're on your own, you know, we're not responsible for you, you should think for yourself. And nobody could explain me why they did not want to create the same top-down structures that I saw in high resilience regions. And because when I asked them, most of them would just say, well, this is how we do things here. This is how things work in this region. Sometimes they would refer to something like, oh, you know, if you create more structures, then it's difficult to dismantle them. You have to keep paying salaries um, to the people. But apparently, in the high resilience region, it wasn't a concern. So that wasn't an answer either. So I could not understand for a long time why the strategies of state officials were so different. But then it occurred to me that I was looking the wrong way and that it did not depend only on the state officials what strategy to choose. In low resilience regions, they could not create centralized structures because they were dealing with a different kind of society, the one in which people resisted <coughs> the state. So to illustrate this kind of resistance, let me read a quote from an interview with a former municipal official who recollected how he tried to obtain cooperation from the people in one of the villages in Rostov region. Quote, everything comes down to informal leaders. If such a leader emerges and takes an office, everything works smoothly. The external authorities have never been praised, but it is a different matter when an informal leader gets elected a leader of a homeowner's association, of a small dwe dwelling, of a block or a street. I can bring a lot of examples from my practice. In Sovetsky district where I worked, there is a village Krivenskaya, 11,000 people. It was impossible to get their cooperation on anything. Even during the Civil War, Budyony was extremely surprised that this village was not burned down. He just could not do anything with it. And it remains the same today. When I started my job, I was sent to oversee this territory. And I could not understand what those people wanted and why we couldn't resolve any issues until I got the main principle of doing things there. They have powerful clans and traditions, and they do not regard as their own even the people who work in Savkhoz across the road. It's very strict there, and Cossacks are particularly powerful. 
I tried to obtain community support on different issues, gathered them in a public hall. It was packed, there weren't enough chairs, and I spoke for a long time trying to convince them until I almost lost my voice. They applauded. I get out and they say, thank you. Everything you said was right. But we, Krivyani, are not going to do that. We are going to do exactly the opposite. But you just agreed. We simply felt bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> I could not understand what they needed. But then it occurred to me that I should have dealt with informal leaders. It was either an Ataman or the head of a block committee. And I began to work through them. They repeated my words exactly, including commas and periods, and were immediately <laughs> cheered by the people. Everything gets done. And you don't need any gatherings and discussions. I tell him, say in your own words. And everything gets done in three seconds. Any issues, social ones, and even fundraisers. The authorities should not try hard to convince people. You may be a thousand times right and convincing, but they are not going to do it anyway. But if their own person says it, they will go over and above. We underestimate it. We frequently come to power and do not take advantage of this, which is unfortunate." End quote. So people in this region, they would cooperate with their community elites, but not with the state representatives, whom they do not consider their own. Uh, and what they would do instead, they would bargain with the state, especially about political support. In the low re resilience regions, I actually came across multiple instances of very concrete requests. What, what will I get in exchange for my vote? One story is uh, from the Republic of Altai uh, is about the head of one village who bragged about winning a minivan for his village because uh, at the elections they were able to deliver a good percentage for the United Russia. And in Rostov region, I heard a detailed account of how a representative of one municipality was bargaining with a regional deputy, trying to get money for a new water pipe system in exchange for electoral support. And not only these kind of exchanges were considered normal and fair, people were actually proud of how creative deal makers they are. And such pragmatic and cynical approach would be unthinkable in the high resilience regions where everyone was supposed to contribute to the common good rather than seek private gain. Seeking private gain would be morally unacceptable. But in low resilience regions, what was morally unacceptable was the intervention of the state and community and private matters. For example, I was asking the regional official whether they um, seek material resources from businesses for public projects, which was a common and absolutely norm normalized practice in high resilience regions. And he thought I was talking nonsense. He said, no, 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 this would be pressure. We don't do that. So I, I can't imagine hearing that in the high resilience regions. So in these two different types of regions, the different attitudes of the people to the state led to the different structure of the grassroots organizations. In the regions where group survival and the state were connected, people were predisposed to cooperate with the state. And if the state officials suggest to do something together, people's reaction is, great, the state cares about us. This is how it should be. Let's do it. And in this situation, it is easy for the state to recruit a lot of activists who become state representatives on the ground. And people take pride in participating in state-led projects because it is their contribution to the common good, and it elevates their status in the community. And as a result, we get ramified top-down structures, very centralized and very predictable. In the regions, oh, sorry. <laughs> in the regions where group survival was separated from the state, people were suspicious of any kind of state request for cooperation. And since it is not the state, but some other collective entity that represents um, their group interests, people cooperate with their, the representatives of that entity, but not with state representatives. Uh, so if people cooperate with their community elites, but not with the state, then state representatives have to deal with informal leaders who turn the state requests into bargains. And in this case, we see uh, the bottom-up clientelistic network with, in which every 
um, every level is a broker that is trying to get as many resources from the higher-ups as possible. And if you <coughs> attempt to create more organizations here, all you will get is more clientelistic demands and more brokers to satisfy. Uh, so I will call the first model of state-society relationship an integrated one, because state and society are two merged together. And the second one, an autonomous one. So let's think a little bit more about the elite strategies that these environments produce. If you are a member of a political elite in a society in which people associate them say, themselves with different non-state groups, then your political power depends on whether you are a legitimate representative of your social group, on whether the people of your group support you. So what you want to do is to cultivate a long-term relationship with your people, and what you want from the state is to provide as many resources as possible for you and your group, because it will strengthen your power. If you are a politician in a society that trusts the state, your political power depends on people's support only if you are the head of the state. If you are anyone below, your power and influence depend not on whether people support you, but on whether the head of the state has endorsed you. <coughs> and if you don't have an endorsement of the head of the state, people will be suspicious, especially about your wealth. So it is in your interest to demonstrate your loyalty not to the people, but to the incumbent. And uh, all of this looks to me, I don't know if Dan would agree, very much like protection and provision pacts that he was writing about in his book. Because in the autonomous model, uh, what the elite actors want from the state is resources, which is provision. And what they want uh, in the integrated model is to share the, the state's legitimacy with them to protect their property and wealth. And another thing that I would also agree with Dan on is that the environment that's conducive to protection pacts, and in my terminology, the integrated uh, model of state-society relationship, it also results in higher authoritarian resilience. Because if you have centralized, top-down public organization uh, that penetrates society and are controlled by the state, then your capacity for routine monitoring and large-scale pro-regime mobilization is high. Because these organizations may be busy with very benign tasks in everyday life. They may be providing education, health care, they may be uh, doing an information campaign for safe driving or you know, a fundraiser to help poor children to get school supplies. But when you need them for political purposes, for information or electoral campaign, they are very easy to reorient. Uh, and since it is the same exact structure that you use for many other things related to provision of public goods, you also <coughs> don't need a lot of additional expenses. Even if the economic situation is not good, this infrastructure will continue functioning even on low resources. Because remember that people are there not so much to maximize their private gain, but to contribute to the common good. And for the same reason, you don't actually need to use that much coercion to stay in power when the economy is bad. The people will tolerate significant hardships as long as they're confident that you continue to care about their group interests. Coercion in this case is the last resort. But if soci the society is divided into multiple non-state groups, which are more important for the people than the state, then as soon as you stop delivering concrete benefits to them, as soon as you stop giving them money to, for that water pipe, they will want to change you to someone else. And if you cannot bribe them anymore, then your only option is coercion. Let me use another scheme of uh, these two models of state-society relationships that will help us think through more implications. So under the autonomous model on your right, uh, we have the society that is divided along different lines. And the state that is struggling with its capacity to govern all these groups, to enforce the rule of law, etc. This state is constantly being hijacked by one group or the other that wants to use public resources for their own goals. Under the integrated model, 
we have the state that dominates society. And not that there are no different groups inside society, but the importance of these divisions is overshadowed by the association with the state. It's kind of the psychology of we are all in the same boat. And you may not like some of your fellow crew members, but if the boat sinks, <coughs> we all sink together. And if you survive, you survive together too. And if there is a big storm, the least thing you're going to be worried about is that uh, s one of your crew members steals something from you. The situation that you're most afraid of is that your boat loses the captain and the crew members start fighting each other. Another good example of this mindset is probably the army. Because imagine that you are a soldier uh, defending your country ex uh, against the external uh, aggression. And maybe you don't like that you know, Trump supporter who's fighting side by side with you. And maybe that Trump supporter also doesn't like you. But you both know that you're defending the same country where your families live. And it is that common interest that becomes a lot more important uh, than your political divisions in the situation of this existential threat. And this is approximately how many Russians feel about their state. It is their boat. And this metaphor is actually frequently used in the Russian pro-regime political discourse, especially when they describe the opposition as the people who rock the boat. So um, there are two important ideas that I want to communicate with this scheme. First uh, is that although these two models are different, they actually do have a common denominator. Because both of them are built around the groups that people consider their own. The boundaries of these groups are different vis-a-vis -vis the state. But how these groups work inside, it's the same in both models. And the second idea is that it is very important to understand that the in-group political economy and between-group political economy are based on different principles. And by political economy, I mean the principles of distribution of resources and power. The currently existing political science theories are really great at capturing the between-group political economy. And they're not nearly as good as capturing the in-group one. Uh, to fully elaborate on these principles of the in-group political economy, as I see them, I would probably need a few more talks. Mm -hmm. So today, <laughs> I will only talk briefly about one important principle related to power and legitimacy. So in the autonomous model, the true legitimacy of the state leader depends on all the factions in society buying either into the personality of the leader, which probably never happens, or to the groups, uh, to the rules, the common rules of how this person is selected, which is essentially uh, the institutions of representative democracy. So as long as all social groups feel like their interests have been taken into account in the political process, uh, the government is legitimate. Whenever some groups start feeling like they have been ignored, the legitimacy weakens. In the integrated model, the legitimacy of the state leader has less to do with the democratic institutions and more with a different kind of legitimacy that is similar to the one of the elders in clan-based society or the pope in the, in the Catholic Church. It is based on the authority of the group that is part of individual's identity, part of who the person is. It is that authority that you recognize as the source of social and moral norms. And it is that the authority, the punishment from which you consider fair if you violated those norms. And this kind of punishment does not invoke a lot of resistance. Rather, it invokes guilt. So if the state enjoys this uh, second type of legitimacy, it makes it very difficult for the people to protest the state. Because it is very difficult to stand up against your own group, against your own people. Political protests and struggles for political freedom are usually the fights for the <coughs> rights and interests of the people you consider your own that are led by the leaders of your group. But in societies uh, with the integrated model, when the people follow their leader of their group to fight for the group's interest, 
they end up defending their state against external enemies rather than defending people's rights against the state. In this sense, political freedom for many Russians has more to do with the sovereignty of their country uh, than with internal political freedoms. And here I actually s also see another parallel to dance <coughs> uh, namely to the article about how the success of protests against autocrats depend on the presence of community elites that lead that protest. In the autonomous model, there are multiple community elites in society that are backed by a strong base. And if they find a way to come together against the autocrat, the protest can be very successful. In the integrated model, community elites are either absent or don't have nearly as strong of a support of, um, from society. So the chances of a successful protest are much smaller. So as a final point, um, I suggest that we think about the implications of these two models for our understanding of democracy and democratization. Because authoritarianism is possible in both the integrated and autonomous models of state society relationships. But it would be two very different types of authoritarianism, one of which is based on a strong state and another one based on a weak state. So the examples of a strong state authoritarianism would be probably countries like Russia and China. And uh, the examples of the weak state authoritarianism would be probably many authoritarian regimes in Latin America and Africa. So what are the obstacles that societies that lean towards the autonomous model face in building a democracy? So their <coughs> problems are well known. And they are related to state weakness and the lack of the rule of law. Because each group in society tries to use and abuse the state for the sake of its own gain. And there is no authority that can enforce a level playing field for everyone. Such society lacks a common identity and an idea of a common good. And democratization in this case goes through building up the identities and institutions that overcome these issues and set up common rules of the game and a good level of social consensus, consensus about those rules. So this is the democratization path that uh, attracts a lot of attention in the literature. A bit more difficult question is what's the problem with a strong state authoritarianism? Because we frequently hear that there is weak rule of law in Russia, and I disagree with it. Because rule of law in Russia, in terms of treating all social groups equally, is just fine. It's true that law is frequently used in Russia to get rid of political opposition, but that does not mean that any particular social group is treated differently, because anyone who dares to protest the state will get the exact same treatment. <laughs> and by the way, if you want to know more about um, how autocrats use law to get rid of um, political, internal political opponents, you can read Fiona's article in World Politics. <laughs> she writes about Africa, and um, in Africa, most countries lean towards the autonomous model, and political opposition there can be either internal or external. That's why these political <coughs> opponents are treated differently. In Russia, all opposition is internal. That's why law is so widely used to get rid of it. Uh, so the problem of the society with the integrated model is not the lack of rule of law but it's rather the lack of accountability of the state. Because the state here is strong and unconstrained. It penetrates the very fabric of society, and it serves as that substance that holds people together. Because society is not separated enough from the state to be able to constrain state power and maintain the institutions of accountability. And the sta state ends up using its power against its own group. And this is similar to the situation of domestic violence, when instead of providing for your family and taking care of its well-being, you abuse your spouse and children emotionally and physically. And they have hard time standing up to you because you are in the position of trust, because they, in a sense, feel one with you. They're looking for justification of your behavior, and their self-worth is gradually eroding. They learn to be helpless, and they may start resisting at all. So the way out of this situation lies through building up people's self-worth and breaking the emotional connection with, this, with the abuser. 
The society here needs to build a collective identity that is separate from the state. And then the political energy of that collective identity will build and sustain the institutions of accountability. So continuing that logic, I suggest we should stop thinking about democracy and authoritarianism as two opposite poles of a continuum. I would argue that it would be better to think of democracy not as one of the poles, but as a balance between the strong state, which has enough authority to work for the common good for all social groups, and a strong, unified, <coughs> and separated from the state society, which is capable of keeping the state accountable to the public. And this idea is admittedly resonates very much with uh, some of the recent work of Frank Fukuyama and also with the famous quote of James Madison about the government that should be strong enough to control the government but also obliged to control itself. The only correction that I would make to that quote is that it's not the uh, government or the state that magically controls itself. It, this function lies with society that should be unified and autonomous enough not to allow the state to act against the public will. So among these two democratization paths, the United States and many other countries have gone through the path that starts with the weak state and divided society. And the backsliding of democracy in these countries is caused by deepening of social divisions. And I'm not quite sure what would be the historical examples of the second democratization path, path but I know that even when Russia democratizes, it will have to take the second path. On that note, I thank you for your attention. Open for questions. <laughs> Just to begin, not not uh, not about the model, but. Could you talk a little bit more about resilience, what you mean by authoritarian resilience? So what I did, in, the, in particular in that quantitative analysis, uh, I was working with uh, the electoral data, and I was comparing the election, presidential elections in 2012 and 2008. And basically my assumption was that in 2012, it was a lot more difficult for the regime to win the elections just because the support of the regime was much, much lower than in 2008. And it was the time of economic crisis, all these kinds of things. So I was looking at which regions were able to maintain or even push up a little bit that support or maybe not allow it to fall down too much, and which regions actually um, couldn't sustain that official electoral percentage. And that's where the official electoral percentage went down together with the popular support. So this is the operationalization of um, authoritarian resilience that I use in particular in my study. But you can think of authoritarian resilience as generally the ability of authoritarian regimes to withstand different kinds of challenges. How susceptible they are, let's say, to the economic crisis. So popularity is the mission? It's is that what you're saying? That is whether they can win the election or not? That, that's the major measure for this? Not exactly. Whether they can stay in power given all the kind of all kinds of problems, all the kinds of challenges that they can face, including a drop in popularity. So this is really interesting. Um, uh, and probably too much to ask for the for the, the general model, but for the Russian case, can you talk a bit about the source of these the, the societal preferences towards the state? So what what historically why so why in these in the, the cases below the line is there this distrust of the state versus the integrative cases where there's strong belief that the state is there to protect their interests? What what are the source of those preferences? What can we say about why some some places are one path and some places are the other? Well, I think we have to look at the uh, history of state formation in those particular regions. Let's say in Rostov region, it used to be at the outskirts of the empire, and that's the region where you know the, um, all kinds of marginalized people went. Let's say the serfs who ran away from their masters, they all went there. And they knew that the government does not dare to actually intervene uh, into the matters in that region, because 
they are the Cossacks. They were that state that, you know, they're usually portrayed as very much pro-Russian state, and that's true that they have this deal with the Russian state, that, you know, we guard your borders, but you don't you dare to intervene in our matters. So they have this autonomy that they negotiated with the state. So this kind of resistance to the state is very much historically driven. And probably I would say that the type of economy that it plays out historically, that you know, in rural areas, it's, I would say that there is probably more probability of getting um, this kind of attitude to the state. Then in industrial areas where there are large enterprises, you know, people are used to live and work in large communities, and particularly those enterprises are, you know, related to the state, and if they have this ideology of, you know, we are contributing to the industrial greatness of the country, as in Kemerova. This is Kuzbas, this is coal mining region, and they definitely uh, derive their self-worth from their role in the industrial development of the Soviet Union historically. So that's how I think the authority of the state was instilled. Although, I would say that this is probably a matter of centuries. So I wouldn't say that it is, it is only the influence of the Soviet Union. Yes. So what would happen if the state switch, the authoritarian state switch its strategy of legitimation? Like, what will happen to the state society relations? Because I'm more interested in China, and I find out that in China, basically, they are trying to do a, basically switch a civic nationalism, which is similar to the Sovietsky Narod, to something more like an ethnic nationalism. And that creates a lot of problems on the periphery, which is basically the outcome of inter ethnic violence in, towards younger Turkic groups. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what would you say about Russia? Because I'm not that sure. Like, I think Russia is still kind of civic nationalism because Putin chose his role caps very carefully. But I'm just, yeah, basically that's like what I'm interested in. Yeah, I think you kind of gave the answer to your question because if they try to change it, they run into problems. That's why they run into problems in the periphery, you know. Uh, but. What you're saying, they're trying to change it from like one idea of who we are to another idea of who we are. And then another idea is kind of exclusive to some of the groups that used to be included previously. Yeah. So in Russia, you know, one parallel that I can probably draw, I think Russia is still kind of in the search of the identity that would really unify everyone. Uh, but one uh, thing is that Russian nationalists, I mean, ethnic Russian nationalists, they're actually not very well regarded by the Russian authorities. They are more of a political opposition because Russian nationalism would be divisive. And what Putin and the Kremlin wants, they want more unification. Yeah, coming back to the previous uh, question, uh, it's fascinating material, but it strikes me, especially in your answer to the previous question, uh, this, this, this gap between uh, relatively short-term indicators that you took for measuring resilience and a very long-term retrospective that you gave in your answer. And then, sort of building up on that, there are uh, other potential gaps or discrepancies to look at. One would be that you just mentioned Tatarstan is, of course, divided ethnically and religiously. I mean, it's, it's a two-community uh, region, right? And it's an ethnic region. Uh, then Altai, did you, did you look at the Republic or Altai Krai? Republic. Republic, yeah, again, this is a, an ethnic Republic, right? And then also, I would say, <clears throat> you measured the, uh, the authoritarian resilience at the federal, looking at the, at the date of the federal elections, right? The presidential elections. Yes, Whereas but I took the regional level data. The, you're looking at the regional level, mm -hmm. and then the regional level is one thing, but the municipal level is even different thing and the difference between big cities like Kemerov or Rostov and rural areas would be another potential uh, gap. I, I'm, not, I'm not even criticizing here, I'm just suggesting. Well, I mean, I agree with you that there are like lots, a lot of diversity if you really dig into it and those models, they're like really theoretically purified, you know, they are the ideal ones just for us to get alternative theoretical tools that we can use when we're trying to explain what's going on in a particular region. Regarding the ethnic region, non-ethnic region, this is something that I actually um, 
try to think about in my research design because this is a very common um, kind of idea among the Russian social scientists that you know ethnic regions, non-Russian regions, they are different because they are in this majority Russian country. And I took deliberately one ethnic region above the line and one ethnic region below the line and one non-ethnic region and one non-ethnic region. So what I saw, it's not about being Russian or non-Russian. It's whether your ethnicity is connected to the state. Tatar's ethnicity is very connected to the state. They are the former imperial nation. And in Altai, not only the ethnicity is disconnected from the state, but also they have clan-based society. Unlike Tiva, for example, that is ne literally next door, has completely different attitude to the state. So um, regarding you know, the short time horizon, well, yes, I used a short time horizon because data are available and because we have this historical kind of opportunity to measure this drop in whether the support, official support, would drop together with the real support. So that's why I use it as an indicator. But then what I discovered, you know, uh, what I observed in the field, it cannot be explained by some short-term political strategies. Because, you know, these organizations, they have been developing over a long period of time. They were telling me stories, again, in, even in that quote, you know, he refers to the pre-revolution time, that these patterns actually continue. They don't uh, change that fast. But generally, yeah, I agree with you that there is a lot of variation. And but we would should your model hold in view of new data, say, if you include 2018 results? But then why? Hold? The reason why I chose 2012 and compared 2008, because in 2012, it was difficult, more difficult to win those elections or more difficult to get a high percentage for Putin than in 2008. What about 2018? What would be the theoretical reason to choose that? Just to check whether it the classification <laughs> still, is still there. And still <laughs> okay. I shall okay. Uh, I have more of a clarification question uh -huh. on this, uh, the central model that you're proposing as a democracy where there is a strong state and also there is a strong collective identity because a lot of some of the democracies that I probably know are more like uh, the autonomous model where mm -hmm. there might be a weak state but like with a, like the, a lot of uh, cleavages and then mm -hmm. like the cutting points. So how, so what you are suggesting is that if given a democracy, mm -hmm. if the state uh, capacity is strengthened, the collective identity will naturally form or is it like, uh, I just want to confirm, is it, is it what you're saying? You know, I don't know what's the first, the egg of the, or the chicken, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, they sort of reinforce each other. But I think the reason why we see a lot of cleavages uh, in democracies <coughs> is because we just, we attend to them. This is something that, you know, uh, fills the public discourse. We don't pay attention to what actually keeps these people from just fighting with each other. Right? Those are the things is that you know they do have the respect for common rules. They do have this, uh, you know, their inst democratic institutions are legitimate. This is not something that we talk about all the time on the news, but this is what is present. And if it's not present, then you have, you know, all these predatory states mm -hmm. that only work towards their own people. Um, did I, yeah. Yeah, so also, there, is there a possibility that there's a strong state, but at, at the same time, there are still like a lot of cutting cleavages? So, is, well, because like what you're suggesting, maybe that even if there's a democracy and there's a strong state, the collective identity might not be formed. There will still be like cross cutting like identities. Is it? I'm not sure I understood the question, but what I want to emphasize is that, again, those are the theoretical models, and I think. All countries, not only uh, do they not match a particular model where there is a variation inside, but also over time it changes, you know? Because in Russia, the state association with the state has definitely weakened in the 90s when the state was much weaker. And the state did not serve as the guardian of people's interests. They felt like the state didn't protect them. And it, it definitely weakened and people started to go and try to you know, associate themselves with other groups. And once Putin came to power and got lucky with the oil money, he was able to reactivate that thing. 
that was still very fresh in people's minds. So, uh, but then I think another important thing is to understand that it's all relative. It's again, it's not that there are no groups in society and the whole society is united. It's what is more important for you, your political divisions or your identity, let's say, as an American citizen. So once political divisions are more important than your citizen identity, then you have this very, very divided politics. I think to restate sort of what I think you were asking, I, and I was also wondering this, is it possible conceptually, theoretically, actually, or is it impossible because of how you're conceptualizing this for there both to be a strong state on the outside and also, as in the autonomous model, these strong okay. internal society divisions. Because we have three versions of this, and logically there's a fourth, yep. with the things around being strong and also the inside being strong. Yep. And is that possible or is that not possible by definition, by how you're thinking about it? And I, I'm not no, sure. No, I think I the societal. The societal divisions, I mean, uh, the identities inside the society and the common identity of the society would be competing all the time. So you're saying it's impossible for them both to be strong? You know, I, I guess it is possible. I guess what matters for democracy, well, though, well, is what whether like. the, the common identity is strong enough. Exactly. Trump's America. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I find this really interesting. I'm only bringing this up. This is totally outside the realm of what you're talking about, so take it with a grain of salt. But you quoted Madison, so I want to bring up the issue of federalism, and I think it kind of gets to mm -hmm. this question. So what happens if you think about the state, not as the state, but as a multi-layered yep. institution, and how can, what role is that playing, or would that change these models? I think we can actually think about democracy and non-democracy inside any group. Because if you take any group, you know, you can find either very, very hierarchical centralized structure or you can find, you know, uh, the difference between any kind of group and the state is that the state has the coercive apparatus, which increases a lot the possibility to abuse the public will. So whoever controls the state, the coercive apparatus in society has a lot more possibilities to do this kind of coercion. So you can certainly use this model, these two things, uh, whether you know people actually think of themselves as one and then they would have different principles of how they distribute resources and power in their group, or they don't think of themselves as one. And then with different layers, layers you would just have more different identities competing yeah. Just a quick yeah, follow. Yeah. I, I follow that absolutely. I'm just wondering if, if the state is more than one thing. So here you're talking about the, the national state, right? But like in the US, the state governments form this intermediary, or were designed to form this intermediary level, right? Yeah, Where again, they can diffuse tension I, before. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. And I agree that the state can be multi-layered. And I'm honestly not a big specialist on real federalism, because Russia doesn't have real federalism. <laughs> they just didn't have a chance to really dig into it and how this would play out. But again, uh, I would emphasize what I said, that you should pay attention to who controls the course of apparatus. And, and what territory. And that would uh, matter for how, you know, how power is distributed, yeah. I have the impression that uh, the autonomous model and the integrated model are end members of a continuous uh, variation and that one might evolve into the other. And I wonder if in applying this, this theory, uh, historically, you can sort of make predictions, or at least you can make an analysis as to what is going on in the society, whether it is evolving from a weak authoritarianism to a strong or vice versa, and whether um, looking back in history, you can see, you can post what happened there in terms of this. Mm -hmm. 
So I agree that this is a continuum, but I actually do not think that strong state authoritarianism or like strong this integrated society can evolve into the autonomous society or the other way around. I think what happens, they keep going between whatever their model and democracy. And you know, they are either closer to democracy or backsliding, or closer to democracy or backsliding. That's why societies that start from different uh, points, they have different problems when their democracy deteriorates. And in terms of uh, how to map it on, into history, I think the um, most interesting question would be when does the state consolidate a state like this? You know, so what kind of historical circumstances lead to a strong state that actually kind of suppresses the societal divisions and establishes itself as that authority that people actually trust? And you know, if I was doing, I, I didn't do historical research on that, but if I was doing that, the first hypothesis I would test would be probably the timing of state consolidation vis-a-vis -vis modernization. And I would think that if states um, actually came together before the society modernized, they would probably m follow more of this pattern. And uh, if it happened afterwards, or for example, the history of colonialism led to the fact that you know, many societies, the post-colonial societies, they lead, uh, lean more towards the autonomous model just because people were resisting the colonizers. And this is something that we get in research when you know, like people put together country-level country data sets. They end up with a ton more countries that follow the autonomous model than um, the integrated model. So it's kind of difficult to test different theories on such data sets just because you would always confirm whatever assumes the autonomous model. So you, you wouldn't think of this, these, these three entities that you are um, placing here as being configured differently, perhaps putting the, the uh, d democracy to the right of the autonomous model. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, that I do not think it's right to think about democracy as one of the poles. I think democracy is more of a balance between these different challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, you understood it right. Yes, I think my question is kind of related to your comments you just made. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to t take a further step to ask, so why in some regions they serve as a primary uh, collective identity, but in other regions, primary identity are nine states one. So in the very beginning, so are these out, uh, are these are the outcome of the history, or so the ruling strategy and the social identity are actually mutually enforce each other. So I'm wondering whether there's some exogenous source of this far ratio of the state mm -hmm. and social identity. So yeah, social. I mean, social identity and the state definitely they reinforce each other. Again, this is the chicken and the egg. I think they they just coexist. Um, then. Um, Something else I wanted to say, and I lost my thought. <laughs> okay, if I remember it, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes, please. So there's a tension, I think, in sort of some of your answers. And so you're studying subnational variation. Right? Mm -hmm. But then in many of the answers, you're talking about the Russian state as strong or weak, as this strategy or that strategy. But isn't the whole point? that the Russian state is both strong and weak, that there are reach subnational regions where these different equilibria prevail, and that sort of extrapolating up to some sort of overall statement about what Russia is like is sort of what you're showing that can't be done by the fact that there is this variation that you're exploring. So sort of what is the level at which you're trying to make claims? Because I think that's sort of getting muddled in the discussion. Well, when I'm saying strong state, I'm mostly referring to how people see it. But which group of people? people well, again, the, I, the, 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 this, is, this is what I'm saying, that I believe that Russia, on average, and the majority of Russians, if you just take the whole Russian population and you kind of measure whom they regard, like how they uh, treat the state, you will see that the majority of Russians will see the state as, as their vote. And yes, there are different regions. Of course, Russia is a huge country. And this is one of the reasons why I was able to capture that variation. In any huge country, you, you cannot have all the people like treat the state the same way or have very, very similar attitudes to anything, right? So 
the fact that there is a variation doesn't prove that the people, like the average attitude to, of people to the state is different. So I don't know, did I answer yeah. the question? Or yes, there has been, Monica, where I'm trying to go is there's been work that looks at sort of how states can be multifaceted within territory. So mm -hmm. a book that came to mind during your talk really closely from me is Kathy Boone's work on the political topographies of the African state. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar argument to yours about how in some parts within a single country you have a deconcentrated state, which is basically what your integrated model is. Other parts you have what she calls a devolved state, which is what your autonomous model is. And her whole point is that you can have this coexisting at the same time within one country, and so we have to sort of rethink what we think of as state capacity and sort of, and so I'm trying to sense if you're trying to make a similar argument to that or if you're challenging that kind of argument and saying, despite this variation, actually the state is like this or it's like that. Because her whole claim is that like we should stop saying state capacity is high or low, but actually it's super variegated locally and we have to understand that variation. You know, I don't think I'm trying to either make a similar argument or challenge that argument because yes, of course, there is variation. We should, you know, look at different levels and I totally agree with that. What I'm trying to say is that you know, the state here is the group, and we should start thinking about what's going on inside Russia as the in-group politics. In-group, in, in the same sense as we think about in-groups there. What I'm trying to say is that this state, for me, it's not the question whether it's weak or strong. I'm just trying to say that, you know, this in-group political economy is very, very different. The legitimacy of the state is very different when the state is of this type. So very possible the book that you know, you're know you mentioning, yes, it probably makes the same kind of argument in terms of regional variation. I totally accept that and I think it's great. But what I'm trying to say is that we don't have good theoretical tools to capture what's going on inside those states that are very strong. Because we keep mapping our uh, theoretical tools developed for that context on this. I keep hearing that Russia is clientelistic. It, like, we cannot use the word clientelism towards many uh, Russian, what's going on in Russia. You know, if people are um, threatened to lose their job, for example, if they don't like falsify election, that doesn't mean it's clientelism. Because, you know, who is going to enforce that? threat to lose a job. It's going to be their own people. It's going to be their colleagues who are going to ostracize them. It's not going to be the evil Putin who will make a call. It is the society that will treat these people as defectors. So this is something we should understand to understand how politics works in Russia. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess my question has to do with I want you to clarify how state strength is defined because mm -hmm. earlier on I understood it as resilience to certain challenges as you had explained mm -hmm. and, if, and if that's the way you're defining it then I understand Noah's point about how strong the state is depends on the region, right? Depends on how it withstands um, challenges in certain mm -hmm. areas. But now it seems like strength is being defined as a function of attitudes, right? Where the, the strength of the state comes down to how strong people perceive it to be. So is it is part of state strength independent of attitude, or are you completely overlapping it with how people perceive the state? So when I talked about resilience, I talked about the resilience of authoritarianism. Okay. So it's not quite the resilience of the state. And when I'm talking about state strength, I'm very much following McDowell when he was talking about weak, strength, uh, weak states, strong societies. And he was arguing that you know, it's, the state has to take that kind of norm setting authority and if it doesn't happen then you know you have all this divided societies and, and problems with state weakness. I think one thing that Migdal probably didn't really get right was that he like reading his work it seems that if only the state gets strong then everything is great. And then he categorizes uh, countries like France and Israel as countries with strong states and weak societies. And I think they actually have, they are more in the democracy category when you have both a strong state and a strong and autonomous society. So this is something that was missing from his work. But I totally agree with him on what is the straight stand, uh, state strength. And this is, uh, just as McDowell said, it's this norm setting authority. Barbara? In this context, um, 
What would you say about North Korea? <laughs> Where depending on what you hear, I understand there's a high degree of, of support for the state that mm -hmm. partly has limited information. Yeah. And it would come out as a very strong state, maybe under the integrated model, mm -hmm. but I don't know. And how do you think of it? And I, I what think do you that make of it, you see what I mean? Yeah, that's probably also a question not only about North Korea, but also the state strength in like the Soviet Union. Because, you know, on the surf everyone knows that on the surface the state was strong and everything else, but also there was a lot of skepticism on people about that state and uh, which we can probably count as some kind of resistance. So I think what happens again, this is that skepticism that is kind of related to this situation of abuse of power. So basically if you keep you know abusing your child, your child will stop trusting you. And it doesn't mean that the child will be able to resist just as someone who is you know a stranger to your abuse. But there will be a certain degree of um, skepticism and distrust. One, one thing that was bothering me was that if you look at what the people in the society think about it, I was thinking about access to information, and I think that people in the Soviet Union had a lot more access to outside information than people in North Korea. Oh, yeah. And in terms of the and, and South Africa under apartheid in some periods also did, like when they didn't have television, really restricted access to outside information. And I guess in terms of state actions to mold and affect what their citizens know, I was just wondering how this factored into all that, what you're talking about. Well, of course, it's difficult for me to answer about countries that I know very but little about. But, but it's fair for us to give you a hard time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're but proposing a let, let, me, let me answer. So, so. state access for, uh, whether the state re restricts uh, access of people to information or like does all these kinds of manipulations or does not allow you know, independent candidates to run, also restricting them from the options, that can work to reinforce a particular model. You know, the society may be trying to recover, maybe trying to get back their self-worth, and maybe, you know, if they were in a more um, favorable environment where there wouldn't be any restrictions for freedom of the press or for electoral process, that recovery would go faster. It's not gonna be very fast anyway. So it's not that even now, if in Russia we suddenly organize very free and you know honest elections, and then we're, there's going to be you know a multitude of parties in the parliament, no, it's not going to be that, and the parliament will still be a little bit of a you know of a hand of the executive power because people aren't used to voting to the parliament, the best watchdogs, you know, they want to see the deputies that will help their president to defend their interests. So this is this mindset that is uh, hard to change immediately. However, if we had at least a few of them, then would people gradually start realizing that you know we need this balance. There, there is a utility for that. But if you restrict those possibilities, then of course you know you just keep reinforcing the same patterns that are already rooted, and that prevents any kind of development towards democracy. I was just wondering how this actual relationship would then really look like between the state and society in this kind of, let's say, idle case we call mm -hmm. democracy. Because the problem is that when we think of, sta of society pretty much as a kind of imagined community, it is something that is pretty much constituted by the very existence of the state as such. So I'm just wondering, actually, if you really had the kind of case of a state and society that would be relatively kind of like in disentangled, would this not then naturally actually kind of like entail the formation of the very same cleavages that we kind of, according to you, uh, needed to be overcome? I mean, I'm also not necessarily thinking whether it's so horrible to have these cleavages in the first place, but I'm just wondering uh, how to make sense of that because it's in the end still the state that is constituting the society within this framework. Well, I think your question actually uh, kind of stems from the fact that some of the most stable uh, democracies have been nation states. 
And I think there is a reason for that, because they on the one, they have this common identity that is not necessarily uh, connected to the state. You know, if you, let's say, the French is not the French state. Right? The French identity is centered around some civic values, cultural values, like something that is not only the state. But definitely, if you have that <coughs> kind of common identity, then it's easier to, to build a state that is going to work for the public interest, for sure. And I think uh, one of the things I was thinking about when you said it's not bad to have divisions, I think, well, it's not that not so much to have divisions, but it's it's good to have the mechanisms of overcoming divisions because. But I mean, it's, I think it's inevitable not to. Have well, yeah, to yeah, exactly. In because in in the history, you know, people society. move around. We never live in a situation when you know we're only with the people we consider our own, and then we don't contact anyone else. So there is all kinds of movement. There are new groups coming to society. There, you know, so if you have developed those. Uh, mechanisms that allow you to overcome social divisions, then you're building that inclusive polity. And then it's easier for you to build that democracy that even if you're coming from a divided society. I would be careful with the French example. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and now this is unfair because I'm a historian and teaching about nationalism, but France is the, is the model of a French, of a state-made nation. Mm -hmm that is highly divided, revolution, state, and then they made Frenchmen out of peasants and so forth in that famous book. So that, that wouldn't be a good example. Uh, they had trouble making a democracy in the 19th century. Revolutions, empire, you know, and so forth. Until finally, maybe by the Third Republic, th those two processes go together. But I'm trying to think where would have been a good, maybe a smaller state somewhere. Mm -hmm would have been a better example, and I can't think of it just off. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So yes. I, I totally agree that France actually evolved from the strong state, but they, they had, maybe that's uh, the case of democratization of the second path, you know, when the state, they were able to separate the state from society, and they were able to put the state under control, at least a lot better than in Russia. You know, so the way, way you can get out of that puzzle is they created in the French Revolution, or just before, a discourse of the nation. Mm -hmm. and the nation as the sovereign body that legitimizes the state. Then, after they had this nation form and a revolution, they went about making the nation and took 100 years to do that. That's the way. But that's, you know, history. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that we can, <laughs> we can figure it out based on this mode also. Yeah. I just want to raise the nationalism question. I was thinking about that mm -hmm. with France, exactly that issue. It strikes me throughout your talk that nationalism is a huge presence here that is playing a really, really big role, right? Because that is kind of the identity that you're saying binds people, like despite their divisions. So in some ways, it seems like the success or failure of this depends on the degree to which the state is successful in establishing a national identity. Well, we actually just had uh, last weekend a talk by Maya Tudor and her project of whether nationalism uh, helps democracy or hinders democracy, and her argument is that, you know, if it creates a unifying identity, like in India, for example, then it helps democracy, but if it creates a divisive identity, then it hinders it. So yeah, nationalism, it's definitely not only a bad force. It's not about whether it's nationalism or it's religion or something else. It's more about do you divide people? Do you help uh, them to overcome their social divisions and do you help them to feel one in this state or is it separating them? Any other questions? That's it? Okay, great. All right, okay thank you all.